Grand Touring Motorsports started as a social group of car enthusiasts, but we've expanded into all sorts of motorsports disciplines, and we want to share our stories with you. Years of racing, wrenching, and motorsports experience brings together a top-notch collection of knowledge and information through our podcast, Break Fix. Before we kick off the Glorious Ladies of Racing Pit Stop episode, all of us at GTM would like to congratulate both Chrissy and her husband, Mike, on their new little bundle of horsepowers and torquems, their 2020 model year daughter, Emily, who is due in December. So if you're listening from the delivery room, Chrissy, send it! And as always, I'm your host, Brad. And I'm Eric. So let's roll. And this week, I have the pleasure of introducing our listeners to one of GTM's more prominent figures, a member who is always looking out for us, often playing den mother to the team, always carrying a smile and a laugh with her around the paddock, always ready to lend a hand while keeping us sane, one of our glorious ladies of racing, the one, the only, Chrissy Crutchfield. Welcome to Break Fix, Chrissy. Thank you, Eric. I'm happy to be here tonight. It's going to be interesting. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So in tradition of our member profiles, we're just going to start off with the easiest question, just going to lob it right over the fence. How did you get started in motorsports or in cars? How about you just talk me through that? I always liked cars growing up. So my grandmother, for whatever unknown reason, had a Monte Carlo SS from like 88 or something like that. And she's a terrible driver, <laughs> but she had this amazing car that sounded amazing. And she had two of them. And it was just always like, this is so cool. You know, it's like, she's got this V8 engine and it's like, I want to be like, I want this car. And like, they died because they're GM, no offense. But <laughs> when I was 17, because that was the driving age in New Jersey, I wanted Rolls Royce that was at the mechanic that my dad used to take the Nissan Pathfinder to. And he refused. He was like, no, you don't know. <laughs> because he's not a, like, he was never a mechanical guy. He, he's just like, let someone else do it. In college, my first car that I owned was an Oldsmobile Alero. I loved that car for a little four cylinder. It seemed like to have a lot of get up and go. And I mean, it was fun. I, I did enjoy driving pretty much anything. Then I met Mike. And since Mike is so intrigued by cars, it's like our first date, we got lost in Baltimore. Never a good thing. Oh, no. It was right after September 11th. So they had everything going on downtown all at once. They had the Ravens preseason stuff. They had Orioles baseball and the Beltway was gridlock. It was terrible. And so it's like, oh, well, let's take a little tour. And we wind up on not even Falls Road, whatever the next exit over is. And it's like we get to this intersection and there's like used car dealership and two bales bondsmen all alternating corners. There must have been a really good Chinese restaurant there. Oh, too. possibly. Oh, no, it was a fried chicken joint. But <laughs> <laughs> it's so Baltimore. It's not even. Yeah, fun. exactly. But then I was like, oh, check out that Monte Carlo. And he's like, <laughs> and so we had a lot of fun. Did you learn to drive stick before you met Mike? Or did you mm -hmm. go through the whole couples therapy of learning to drive stick? Yeah, the couples therapy of learning how to drive stick. Basically, we were together for four-ish years, married for about two months. He'd always known that he would wanted a Jetta Golf even. And he's like, definitely going to be a manual because his one friend, he would take his boss's R32. And it's like they would go off-roading, which was actually just backcountry roads in Montgomery County. <laughs> yeah, so they would just go tearing through the woods and this manual R32. And he always was like, I need one. And so he got the Jetta before we PCS to Germany. Sorry, permanent change of station. So he was like, well, we can't have a truck, which was the Nissan Frontier. And so he traded the truck for the Jetta in 2005. We're over at Mount Hebron because <laughs> we were living out at his mom's house before we PCS. He's like, okay, I'm going to take you to the school parking lot and we're going to teach you how to drive stick. And if I didn't scream and yell and it's like, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I will say having ridden with you, I mean, you're, you're very smooth. I mean, it's like you've been, you've been driving a stick shift forever. So he, he taught you well. So I, I give you that. Eventually. <laughs> He made me so anxious and I determined that I wasn't going to drive when we got to Germany. It's like, to hell with this. I'm not driving. You're going to drive me or I'm going to 
buy a bicycle and I'm going to mosey through the hills with pigtails and a basket on the front of the bike. Like a scene out of a Heidi. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> of course, it's been downhill since then. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So living, you know, being with Mike, being married to Mike, obviously he talked in his interview about being a very big NASCAR fan, right? Big yeah. senior fan. That's what he grew up with in his house, even though, he, as he put it, he was the black sheep, right? Nobody in, in his household was into racing. And that seems actually to be a common theme for a lot of us. For you, was racing a part of growing up? Was it something you were interested in or something you did? Oh, no. <laughs> we lived on a little island in New Jersey. And so it was basically, we go fishing on the weekends, which Blah. <laughs> Although I, I do appreciate having spent that time <laughs> doing things like that. No, <laughs> definitely not. Watch History Channel and that was pretty much it. Magnum PI or whatever. <laughs> I, those are, I do that now. So that's yeah. definitely a bad thing. Do you share the same interest in NASCAR that Mike has, or do you find yourself interested in other forms of motorsport? And I say that because if we look back over the years, mm -hmm. the races that we've gone to together, Rolex, I know we, we've done the Le Mans viewing party at your guys' yeah. house. So WEC and, and Le Mans and ALMS, IMSA seem to be very big for you. So mm -hmm. do you find yourself in both camps? Do you have a favorite there? I feel like as we've gotten more into like the high performance driving and just like sitting there and watching races, like I, I appreciate NASCAR. That, that's cool. And I like the IMSA racing, like all those different series in IMSA, like the Lamborghini Super Trofeo for the Crash Fest. And, <laughs> and um, he'll randomly like sort through the gazillion and one channels that we have. And like the one day, we're sitting there flipping through the channels and all of a sudden he comes across one of the Isle Mon races and it's the time trials with the sidecar bikes. And I'm like, what is that? That's amazing. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's just like, I mean, over the time my interests in motor racing have even evolved because it's like, I get that these people are just so tactical and they've learned how to drive well and they're good at their craft. I just, I have an appreciation for it. Yeah, I'm on this sad misfit island of people that appreciate rally. I will never find my soulmate, I suppose. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, I appreciate rally. Like, I mean, with Banner yeah. Faust. Yeah, like, I mean, that that's sort of cool. And like, they did the TDI Cup. And so, I mean, it's like, that's not necessarily the world um, rally car stuff. But I mean, it's like that stuff I can appreciate. The things I don't appreciate, it's like drag racing. I'm like, what's the point? Parking lot playtime the yeah. autocross yeah it's like meh. i mean and perhaps i should give it a chance but it's just not something that i'm wanting to do so. <laughs> mike talked a lot about germany and the time you guys spent over there and, and laps at the nurburgring and and, and hockenheim and, and stelvio pass and things like that Mm -hmm. Do you think that propelled you into going into high performance driving or was there something, was there already like a fire there that you wanted to try it? Once he convinced me to go ahead and get licensed in Germany, he was like, oh, just take the test. Well, I missed it by three points the first time around. So I took it the second time, did better than him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so at that point, then it was just principle of the matter. It's like, well, I'm going to get a car. And he's like trying to get me into this little E30 BMW and I wasn't good. I wasn't confident in driving stick still. And, and so it's like this car didn't have hill hold like the Jetta. So I'm sitting here like I almost backed into someone going up one of the hills in V-Spot. And then it's just like, oh no. I had an E90 90, or 2006 um, BMW 325i because that was sort of a treat to me because I was getting a job and everything and he got me that it was a great car so yeah. was that in addition to the 135 or okay. no the 135s later gotcha. so yeah we had the jetta and since i didn't drive stick at the time i was like okay you have to buy me a car that i want well he tried to convince me to get the mark 5 r32 and i was like no nah. <laughs> it's cool. like if we're gonna be in germany we're gonna have an actual german built car <laughs> What do you think, kind of looking back, because it's been years now, I mean, since you guys been in Germany and all that started, mm -hmm. if I do the math and correct me if I'm wrong, it's been about a decade or so. More. Yeah, it's 12 years now. So if yeah. you look back over all the track time you've had, all the different places you and Mike have gone to, and he talked about 39 events in a season and things like that, especially here stateside, it, it's absolutely ridiculous. And you guys go together and you're always there. And I know you've driven every track that probably Mike has driven on. Not quite, but <laughs> <We're> <laughs> close. There. 
Yeah. What do you think is some of the more challenging parts of this sport? Yeah, I mean, it's like because we had bonded with people so early on in starting the going to the HPDs, it's like we met Pat really early on and like both Pats for that matter. They just welcomed us with open arms. <laughs> and um, I mean, it's just like we built that relationship early on. So I never felt intimidated. And they're like, come on, you're going to get on track. You're going to get on track. I'm like, no, nah. finally, they talked me into it and don't regret it. So. <laughs> So do you find driving at the track in the States to be easier, about the same, more challenging than your experience in Europe? In Europe, it was basically, here you go, buy a pass, have fun, stay right. That was basically the way it was in Germany, going to the Nürburgring, going to the Hockenheim ring. Both of them were within an hour of where we lived at the time. So it was just go out and you do one lap and then go back through the gantry at Nürburgring. And then it was 15 minute sessions at Hockenheim ring. Like I said, you just drive and stay right unless you're passing. So what would you say of all the tracks you've been to, what's your favorite or maybe even your top three? I appreciate once I learned the more technical courses, just the aspects of being able to do them and throw the car that I'm working with at the time into the, that particular thing. But I, my confidence is always sort of like lingering in the background saying, no, you can't do this and don't hurt the car. I find myself not being able to enjoy a lot of the tracks that a lot of people like. I would say my favorites, the Watkins Glen, Pocono, the mega course. I like Thunderbolt a lot in New Jersey and I like Shenandoah. And I know a lot of people don't like Shenandoah, but I love Shenandoah. <laughs> I really enjoyed that. What was it? The Southeast course that we did, VIR. Oh, the South configuration for VIR? Yeah. yeah. That was a lot of fun. I, I sort of enjoyed that one. <laughs> you know, I have to agree with you there. Uh, I usually go and run full course. That's just my thing. Yeah. But I found that running South course VIR was really good exercise for getting Oak tree right because mm -hmm. you came up on it so many times in a session so quickly. It wasn't like, okay, I got to wait another two minutes to come around to Oak tree to try it again. It was like, Hey, this is a much shorter lap. I can keep practicing Oak tree. I can keep mm -hmm. practicing, you know, parts of the S's and, and, and other sections of the track that you really want to nail down. And so I thought that was actually a lot of fun. Yeah, well, and my thing was going to VIR was that I'd never driven the main or the grand course or the full course. And so I was only familiar with South course. So that was thrown into the full course. I didn't know where I was, as you remember. And so it was just like, I didn't know what to do with myself because the line is different coming out of the infield. And I mean, it's like in as many times as I've ridden along with Mike and you and other people, it just it didn't want to click with me. And plus the car broke. So. <laughs> and I hate driving in weather and rainy overcast weather. My eyes don't do well. I feel like I didn't get a lot of enjoyment out of the full VIR course. So would you say maybe that's like the bottom of your list? Or is there, is there another track that you're just like, yeah, I would never go there again? <laughs> NC car. <laughs> what a mess that was. Oh, God. The, those 270 degree turns. I mean, they're just giant skid pads, but. Making a left turn. <laughs> Another left turn. I mean, I can. I add it to my list to say I did it, and, I, and we did. And we were down there for the weekend, but man, yeah. I'm kind of with you. It definitely ranks at the bottom. What would you say is maybe your biggest oops moment on track? Hey, we heard about the Dukes of Hazard episode coming home from VIR, <laughs> but that doesn't count. No. <laughs> Like I was saying a little bit earlier, my I feel like my confidence gets the best of me. So like I doubt myself a lot. And so it's like, oh crap, I missed this mark. Therefore I wind up messing up the entire rest of the course or throws me off or like something gets out from under me like at the IR when I was doing full. It just like there was something not quite right. And so it's like I rattle myself and that's not good. And so it's something I wish I could get past and maybe one day I will. But <laughs> at this point, I, I feel like my confidence gets the better of me. I, I mean, there's no one experience that stands out that other than just like not recovering correctly. Yeah. And fortunately, it's not ended in bad things like crashes, but at the same time. So. <laughs> I mean, I could ask you a selfish question, ask you who your favorite instructor is. I mean, the first answer is going to be Mike and then we'll just go from there. No. <laughs> so I figured 
because like I was saying, like back with meeting Pat and others, it was like, okay, they're encouraging me and they're like, no, don't drive with your husband. Don't drive with your husband. And so the first time I went out was with another Friday at the track instructor. We had a great time and I did great in spite of the vehicle that wasn't supposed to be the vehicle that we were taking but things break and so I mean it's like I had a lot of fun and then the next time we do a track days event and not paying attention they match up the car with the instructor and it's like oh Volkswagen Rabbit let's put Mike Crutchfield in the car not noticing that Chrissy Crutchfield (laughs) is on the list (laughs) brilliant and I mean it's just like and so it wasn't bad having Mike in the passenger seat in the rabbit because he knows the car and so it's like okay and so he could tell me where exactly to put the car for when it was on tracks. (laughs) I've ridden right seat with you many times I know you've had what Uncle Sparky in the car with you George Mm -hmm. Kelly. that was a that was another interesting instructor former member of GTM uh, from EMRA but I will say, I think everybody has walked away and even the people that run in your same run group say the same thing. Chrissy is one of the most conscientious people on track, Mm -hmm. early point buys, always aware of what's going on. And it's a pleasure to be on track with you. So I... I'm giving you that compliment again Thank right you. now, but I mean, you've, you've, I think you've done really well. I think in some respects, you've been dealt a raw hand sometimes because the car has changed underneath of you so many times. And <laughs> not, I'm not trying to call out Mike here. You flip flop between a 325i and the Beetle and they're, they're night and day different from each other. They really are. Yeah. I think I know what your answer is going to be, but which of the two do you, do you prefer at the end of the day? At this point, I'd like to be back in the 325 if it were able to be in the conditions like that it was at its peak. So like when we had that high tuned um, differential, it was at like 392. So I mean, it's like the shifting was amazing in it and you could rev it all the way out to like 9000 or whatever. And it was just it felt so good. And it was chip tuned and it was just everything felt right about it until obviously it wasn't. (laughs) And I mean, it's like the bug has its moments. And I mean, I don't mind driving it, but like, okay, so when we were at pit race last year, that was the last time I drove it on course. And I didn't feel confident in it because I wasn't familiar with the course and there have been a couple of issues with braking. And so like the pedal was a little mushy. And so I was just like, this is Mike's toy backing away (laughs) and you've ridden right seat with a lot of people what Mm -hmm. would you say is probably one of your favorite cars you've ridden in on track i don't know i mean that's a fair answer i mean i i don't i don't know that i've driven with that many people right seat i drove um my ego asked me to take out jessica two years ago at shenandoah and we took the mini cooper the automatic mini cooper and i let her drive it a lap or two and i was like well here let me show you And so we did Shenandoah together and I walked her through the line for a front wheel drive car because that's generally what I was driving. It it was fun to be in that perspective. I don't want to be a coach by any means, but I mean, it was at least fun to sit in the right seat and give similar instruction to which I had received. I like going for ride alongs. I don't always feel comfortable (laughs) with like five point harnesses and everything. Your car, the TT, when it used to work, (laughs) well, it's working. Wow. 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 Shots fired. No, it's, it wasn't that meant, (laughs) it wasn't meant that way, but I mean, it's like there, there was a time (laughs) and it might've been one of the last times before it went under just for the point of clarity here. I mean, yeah. the motor is completely different. If you get in that car now compared to the way it was back then, it's like it's like a totally different animal. It, it's pretty cool. And and I yeah. the next time it's out and about, I will I promise you, listeners, I'm taking Chrissy out in the Okay. So Sounds good. <laughs> So let me flip the script here a little bit. If you, you know, you talked a little bit about helping out Arrigo's daughter there at one of the HOD events, Hooked on Driving. Mm -hmm. Getting that little bit of taste of coaching, let's kind of unpack that a little bit and say, what kind of advice would you give somebody starting out in the road racing discipline? I've been really lucky for having such a big community going into it. It's like I've had this support group all along that's like, okay, you got to go out, you got to do this. And there's that. The best thing I could tell someone is 
just have a support group, have your mom come out with you. Just like they might not be totally behind you jumping in a car with a million people going a thousand miles an hour or whatever. But I mean, it's like, at least you have that little cricket in your ear saying you can do this or be confident in yourself. Know that you don't know everything. It's like, just because you did good on fours, it doesn't mean you're going to do good on the track. Your front wheel drive car isn't going to be the same as that Corvette that you're driving in Forza. Just expect different things for your car. There's a lot of information on the internet. Look it up. GTM, we have a lot of resources on the website for like what I wish I knew and things to do before your first track day. And even like when you sign up for these track day events, the emails that they send out actually make suggestions. Like these are things that we'll go through with tech inspections if they do them. Consider getting your brake fluid changed and checking your brakes and this app. Use resources if available. That's pretty much all I can say, unfortunately. I mean, and I'm sure that it would help anyone. I've had the fortune of having someone else do it for me, so. What's wrong with that? You got your pit crew, your master mechanic, and a yeah. race engineer all in one, right? <laughs> right? Yep. Room, desk, or car, which do you clean first? Oh God, the cars aren't a mess. <laughs> Work desk is always clean. Right now, my home desk is a mess. <laughs> I'd like to say I take better care of the interior of my cars, but no. <laughs> right. I'd like to say my house is immaculate, but it's not. <laughs> if you had a hundred grand to spend on any car, what would you buy? Oh, uh, well, that's not enough money. <laughs> <laughs> Inflation, <right>. man. <laughs> I mean, okay. So- <laughs> If money was no object, what car would you buy? <laughs> if money was no object, I'd want a Huracan, <laughs> Lambo oh, Huracan. Very cool. What color? I would like that really bright green. Xbox green, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. If you could turn back time and warn your 16-year-old self about something regarding driving or, or riding in a car, what would you tell young Chrissy? Eyes up. Something we hear all the time. I, I feel like there's an accident story behind that one. Like I said, being from New Jersey, driving age was 17. Mm. So I got my license when I was 17. I was driving to school. It was like senior cut day. So I was just going to go in late, but whatever. (laughs) I accidentally sort of dozed off like five blocks from home. I I hit a car. I totaled my mom's car. So (laughs) I mean, and it's like, that's not necessarily anything to be like eyes up about. But at the same time, it's like, okay, make sure that you're always alert enough to be on the road. And so just because you're awake one moment doesn't mean that you're actively able. So I mean, it's like, especially back when I used to do shift work, there was the one day I was driving home and it's like, I'm 15 minutes from home and I had to pull over. My eyes are like, I'm, I'm like sitting here driving with my knees, trying to keep my eyes open. And it just wasn't good. And, and so Mike calls me and he's like, where are you? Because he has breakfast waiting on the table for me. And I was like, sorry, I just wasn't making it. So, I mean, it's like, definitely be aware of your limits. Eyes up. When you're driving on track, what really gets you excited? Is it the speed? Is it the cornering? Just being out there with the other cars? Is it the freedom of putting the foot to the floor without, you know, the cherries and berries following you or you know, <laughs> th- those being the, the police lights? Yeah, I know. What is it that, that gets you excited about it? I like the adrenaline rush. I don't do a lot that like really like makes me sort of like my heart palpitate. <laughs> so I get, I get really excited just to be out there and just learn something new and like try and just drive the car to the most of its ability that first hpd that i did here in the states like i said the car was broken i I think being a volkswagen the axle was broken and so we couldn't get into the shop in time it's a common thing you've heard it through multiple episodes (laughs) are a problem (laughs) and so it's like we have to take my jetta sport wagon out (laughs) And it's like, I loved that car so much. It's a six-speed manual and it's got all the diesel torque behind it. And I mean, I'm just cruising along. <laughs> and I mean, it was just, it was so exciting and it's just fun. You know, it's, it's something you can't do. You're not supposed to do on public roads. You're not supposed to go 122 miles an hour <laughs> on a public road. And it's just the experience. It makes me smile. <laughs> Wagon, sedan, convertible, or coupe? Like I said, I loved, loved, loved my wagon. It was a really great car. I wish we could get more wagons like that here in the States, but of course, 
No. <laughs> Everyone would rather have an SUV. You would pick a wagon over your 135? Yeah. Like I said to Mike, boy, that was a really stupid move to buy a convertible. <laughs> it's like it would have been great if it was a 135 coupe. I loved that car, too, and it was a lot of fun. But at that time, we didn't have HPDs or anything. And obviously, Mike wouldn't pass the broomstick test, as you've seen it in some pictures. <laughs> and um, so it wasn't really anything that we could use for that anyway. If you had to, say, start over... Get rid yeah. of the 325, the Beatles, not an option. And you just wanted to buy a track car for Chrissy. And we've mm-hmm. had this what should I buy discussion before with you guys. What would you buy for just you? Just to go to the track. Probably a 135. E87. Nice. It, it was a very fun little car. It's very nimble because it's the right size. So, I mean, you're looking at like golf sized essentially. And so, I mean, and it just, it had that six cylinder engine under it and it just like it pulled and it was just such a fun car best sounding engine you know i was thinking about this and it's like like when we were down at the imsa race in daytona i loved hearing the corvettes like everything else is so quiet around like you watch the lambos and the ferraris and they're like they come and it's like <laughs> but then you hear the corvettes <laughs> like roaring down the front and it's just like there's there's something like about racing that is noise you know even the beetle or with the modified exhaust and the rabbit that had the modified exhaust they were fun like you go in a tunnel and it's like oh i'm taking this out <laughs> throw it all the way you know <laughs> full send and so <laughs> So yeah, I mean, it's just like, I I love exhaust sounds. I, and it's like, as far as motors go, there's the comfort in the Volkswagen motors. There's, I like the purr of the BMW, the inline six, that's a nice motor. But I, I appreciate pretty much all the motors, except for that guy down around the corner and his motorcycle. He doesn't know how to shift. So... <laughs> Since you're talking about the auditory side of racing, right? That mm-hmm. We actually talked about this on an earlier episode with John Cafisi. We did a V8 convertibles episode. One of the criteria that locked us into V8s was the sound experience, right? That you get from a V8. And so that what you just said made me think, how do you feel about racing as we move into this electronic digital era where don't hear a Tesla going down the road and Formula E already exists? What would racing be like for you if you you just couldn't hear anything? It's hard to say. I, I understand the benefits of a quieter car just because, I mean, obviously they've got good aspiration and everything, but at the same time, it's like there's something about that throatiness of an engine brings you into it. Do you think racing would be boring? None of us have gone to see a Formula E race. So I, I assume it's as competitive as anything else. They've worked out the kinks in their format, you know, driver changes and car changes mm-hmm. and, and that kind of stuff. But I just, I don't know what it would be like if, you know, you're just watching a Formula car go around and you don't hear anything. Yeah. Well, with Formula One, for instance, I'm not crazy about Formula One. There's not enough noise. And so <laughs> it's just like, and it's boring race. I mean, let's face it. It's like, there's no changing positions unless there's a crash. So <laughs> it's like, eh, like I said, I, I very much like the noise. So since you yeah. brought Formula One, do you think an F1 car could drive upside down in a tunnel? Probably. If it gets enough speed. (laughs) (laughs) There you go. All right. And one last for fun question before we move on to the last segment of our interview. I I like throwing this one at people. It just, it's a guilty pleasure of mine. Clarkson, Hammond, or May? Uh, They're all funny. (laughs) Jeez. They pick on um, Richard Hammond a lot, (laughs) but, and I mean, it's like, but he's the most skilled driver of the bunch. So it's like, I, I appreciate his skill, but I love all three of them for their, for their quirks. And I mean, it's always fun to watch May and it's like, he gets these quirky cars, like the great European tour that they did and um, Top Gear, God. 15 years ago or whatever i love that i love that episode and like the next time i saw it after we did Silvio pass i was like oh, this is so, so great <laughs> and i mean it's like he has this little like crappy i forget what it was i think it it might have been a 
old BMW, like maybe a 2002, but it didn't run worth crap. <laughs> and it's funny that they just put each other in these like weird positions. And so they have a great dynamic and it, it's fun to watch. So, but yeah, I'd say Richard's probably my favorite. <laughs> so let's talk just a little bit about Australia. We did a follow on episode with Mike about the time you guys spent over in New Zealand and Australia. Mm-hmm. And we talked a lot about Bathurst and we talked a lot about sheep and, <laughs> and a lot of other things. It was a very entertaining episode. But give us your take. We were down in Wellington, which is beautiful. I went out and it's like, I'm a jaywalker by nature. You don't jaywalk there. Oh my God, I almost got hit the first day. <laughs> and I, but I didn't realize it's like, okay, your little walking sign, when it goes Amber, you should have already been across the intersection at that point. Whereas here, it's like, oh, okay, I got 15 seconds. That was a little scary. They have a much better public transportation system than we do here, which I appreciate. We didn't have a car in New Zealand, but you got to see things like the SSs and not the SSs, the Holdens and just like other stuff that you haven't seen in a while. Some other brands that are European only and down there. There wasn't a lot of car stuff that Mike didn't cover. There's one question he didn't answer, though. Which What's is, that? How weird is it being a passenger on the left side of the car? Well, I can go into that when I talk about Australia. We got a rental car in Australia. So you go over to Sydney for Christmas, and we got a little Mark 7 Volkswagen Golf. And so we're sitting there. Mike gets adjusted. He's taking the right seat first. And... I'm always the co-driver regardless. My attention's like everywhere. I'm like, my eyes are popping out of my head and his eyes are popping out of his head. And, and it's just like, what do we do? And these people can't drive. And it's like, oh my God, everybody's going so fast and it's so much going on. It was such a bizarre, surreal thing. And it's like, okay, you're still doing everything normal except you're shifting with your left hand and the pedals are still the same on the right side. So it's like, it's just, it's so different and just remembering that you're staying on the left (laughs) rather than the right you get used to it but it was exhausting that first hour or whatever it took to get from the airport to the hotel we got to the hotel and it's like we are not going back out (laughs) like we could have taken the car and gone for dinner or whatever nope we were staying put we ordered room service and we just we were exhausted just driving around for an hour or so. And it's like, okay, well, we're going to go to Bathurst and we're going to go, like, we're going to leave at 6 a.m. and <laughs> just get on the road ahead of everyone because traffic was mayhem downtown. And so it's like we got out of Sydney real quick and drove the countryside. It was gorgeous. Eventually just happened to wind up at Bathurst. It's like, oh, look there. <laughs> we're on course. So what did you think of Bathurst? It was does cool. It, does it live up to the legend? Yes, I would say so. It, it was really neat to see. It's interesting because it's a two-way road, Monday through Friday. It's like you, you take it the correct way, like the raceway, and you're on the left side. It's a matter of following the correct line from the wrong side of the car, <laughs> trying not to swipe the wall, which is why you get rental car insurance. Mike was pretty sure I was going to hit the wall. I thought he was going to hit the wall. So, I mean, it's fair. <laughs> It was like, you know what? I've never done, I've never done any of the courses like at Summit Point or anything in reverse. He has. I was like, let's do it in reverse. And so we do it in reverse <laughs> and run it a few more times. And it was just, it, it was silly. It was a lot of fun. It was neat to be somewhere else. And it, it was just a different experience. Are there any famous racetracks in the world that you'd like to see? Like a bucket list thing? Laguna Seca. I'd like to go there. Looking forward to going to Le Mans in 23. What is it, three years? Yeah. So, yeah, looking forward to that. I wouldn't mind going back to Daytona. I'd love to be able to find a track day to take the, the infield course and just drive it for a little bit and have a good time. <laughs> I, I have to agree with you there. I mean, the going to Rolex was a heck of an experience. And, and yeah. for me... That was, you know, 15 years in the making. I don't know how many times Matt asked me, hey, do you want to go to Rolex? I'm like, oh, I can't. I got to work. I got to do this. I got to do that. Mm-hmm. And when we finally did it in 2018, 
and we went down as a group. I mean, what an experience. I mean, the stories that are, are still left on the table to tell are, are just amazing. What a trip that was. And if anybody's interested in going back and reviewing that, go to the website and search Rolex. It'll come up. There's a lot there. There's a lot of, there's must be a thousand pictures in the archive. I mean, it was a very, very cool experience. Yeah. We like Doug's creeper pictures. And, and you know, just for the listeners, the upside to Daytona being in that bowl, I kind of view it like being in the Coliseum. You got the NASCAR effect because you could see the whole track. So watching a 24 hour race of which I only slept for like two hours all through the night, all through the day, you were constantly watching the race. It's not like some of the other tracks where, okay, he came by and now I got to wait two minutes and I came by again. And you know, like the Glen, it's impossible to see all of it. Le Mans, I, we know that's going to be a challenge. We're probably going to spend a lot of time moving around over the course yeah, of the meandering. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But Rolex was a, just a different experience. Cause you're like, Oh my God, it's all here. It's yeah. way better than being on TV. And, and to your point with the Corvettes, that was a sound that just resonated through the bowl and you'd feel it in your chest every yeah. time they went by start finish. You're like, Oh my God, this is ridiculous. But mm -hmm. I don't know. Absolutely incredible. So I, I have to agree with you there. Yeah. No, I mean, it's just, we've seen a lot of good racing. We've done a lot of good racing. Sorry. <laughs> it's not at all that it's just playing, but um, it, it's really a neat experience that I'm glad that, just happened to get into and then we were at baltimore auto show and summit point i probably greg haas is sitting there manning a table and it's like oh come out um do an hpd and it's like okay cool <laughs> and i mean it was still a year and a half before we even did it or before mike even went out and so i mean it's just like you don't know until you try let's hit third gear here and let's talk about your experiences with the club just for the listeners out there chrissy is the two-time recipient of the Pit Crew Award, which is our MVP in supporting the club in a non-track uh, role. So that's where we, you know, in our intro, I talked about you being the den mother and kind of taking <laughs> care of all of us. You and Mike both share the honor of also having won the Cannonballer Award, which is the <laughs> longest tow or drive to any GTM event. I think the record now is 820 miles or slightly more than that. So Barbara, I want to say it was over a thousand, wasn't it? I would have to check with Mike. I'll admit that last year that was an excellent trip because we were in Florida visiting with his family. We were helping out his parents for a couple of weeks. And then it was like, okay, well, 4th of July weekend, we're heading over to Alabama. <laughs> and so, I mean, it's like that, that was a pretty epic road trip for us. We haven't done a road trip like that in many years. So well, it was I like... Unfortunately, 2020 has postponed almost all of our plans, including yes. this, this year's Cannonball Run. So that's super unfortunate for all of us because we did mm -hmm. have some really good plans in place. But that being said, you know, as Mike always constantly reminds me, it's okay not to be right as long as you're technically right. So he'll correct us <laughs> whatever the mileage was for that particular <laughs> award. But you guys currently hold the record. It used to be held by John Wade. Uh, who would drive up from Alabama to Summit Point every yeah. year. So we kind of beat that considering how far you guys are out. But that, all that aside, you know, you've been a prominent figure in the club. You, your member number is different than Mike's because everybody's issued one independently because they're yep. their own person. Both of you have been around since the very, very early days of GTM. So talk to the listeners and tell them what your experience has been like, what, what it's been like watching us you know, kind of grow over the last six years, you know, whatever you want to share about your experience with GTM. I think my five years coming up in August, it's just been, I forget. It was like one day we were, was it an SCCA event? And I think Tanya was there too with her bug. And we're just, I was like, Mike, check out this girl. She like, check out the bug. I can't believe it. It's just an amazing little car. And then I see her hanging out with you. And then I see Jess with her wagon. I'm like, oh, well, okay. These people are awesome. <laughs> and so, I mean, it's like, I forget, like, I think you were talking to Mike because you guys were both instructing. And so you guys had already like made a connection. And then it was like, I got to talking to Tanya a little bit. And I mean, it, it, it was fun because at that point we had another group that we were mingling with. However, they're 30 years older than us. So it was neat to have another group who were, were our age. 
it was nice to have this new little like click that we didn't have before and it's like hey we're all driving volkswagens <laughs> and so it there there was that and it's like okay so we're doing okay here and i think just i, I think that that was actually a really nice thing just to all be like it's like we're not the only ones in volkswagens what <laughs> it's like nobody so, takes volkswagens out <laughs> so Tanya had the beetle at that point that was actually you're right that's a, an scca event and that was mm-hmm. later because the first time i met you guys was a track days event and tanya was running her audi coupe the red one right and- and that's yeah. the weekend. It was Fourth of July weekend or something. It was blistering hot, and that's yeah. when I had the brake failure in the, in my Audi. And you guys came to help me out. You were paddocked just a row over from us, right behind Sam, next to Doctor Ben. Like yeah. we were all there together, and there were you know we all kind of banded together. And I believe that was also the weekend. The first day was blistering hot, and the second day we were all camped out under the tents trying to yes. stay in the rain. Uh, because and they shut the track down and i'll never forget vasily went out he was like the only car on track and he's like made it what two laps he's like i give up it's over yeah. it's like a river <laughs> we're done <laughs> it's it's good times those early days but i think we've come a long way since then too we really have yeah i mean it's like what are we like 80 members now rather than just like the 10 of us or whatever it was in the beginning <laughs> <laughs> so i mean it's like yeah it was like there was the core group of you tanya me mike matt and, matt, matt, and matt, all them yeah and brad but it's like then it just like it evolved <laughs> to this thing and it's like oh well, this guy's cool or this guy is mike's student but it's like yeah sure <laughs> you know he's like on the same wavelength as us and yeah so i mean it's just been neat we've had the opportunity to meet so many people that we probably went not across otherwise <laughs> and lots of love here <laughs> for everybody, obviously. So Absolutely. we love you too, Chrissy. I mean, you Aww. take care of us all the time. I mean, it, it, it just goes with and you us. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite GTM event? Oh, all of uh, all the years, all the stuff that we've done, what would you say is your favorite? I really had a great time doing Daytona. It was exceptional. Like was I, did I initiate it? I forget what happened, but it's like, there was an email and I was like, oh, look, for $1,300, we can get tickets to the suite and we'll stay there for like 24 hours. And it's like, how awesome would that be? Because like at that point we had done Le Mans like two years or whatever in a row. And yeah, the view was, party, yeah. yeah. And it's like, let's do it. <laughs> and so it's like, no, October, November or whatever. And it's like, I like, I guess it was a Facebook ad that popped up. I was like, let's go. <laughs> and so, um, nothing else to do in January. I mean, well, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, why not go someplace warm? Like I said, I don't know if it was me or who it was who like initiated it, but it's like, let's just do it. And so it's like, it was like 10 of us, right? There was a lot of us. I'd have to go back and look at all yeah, the went, but, but it was a lot. Yeah. And so we're sitting here and like, we took over <laughs> this the lounge it seemed like that night and i mean we just had so much fun i like our cannonball run stuff i like pretty much everything we do i mean i love that we spend holidays together even like since we didn't travel for christmas um that we can just come over and hang out and have christmas with you guys so Absolutely. i mean I, I, I like the family connection especially since we don't have family in maryland anymore and i mean it's like my mom's two hours away but still it's two hours <laughs> and honestly <laughs> to be honest as weird as this sounds even though i'm like totally into track driving i hate driving on the road i i hate driving on public roads so <laughs> so yeah the less i can do of that the better <laughs> yeah no i i mean i i mean it goes back to the camaraderie and the fellowship like you talked about the other day it's a bond that we've built that is just so meaningful now and it's just this big extended family that we can always turn to and we can hang out with and yeah, like any family, like you bicker or whatever, but then you turn around and it's like, Oh, sorry, bud. You know, <laughs> you know. Got the weird, crazy uncle or two in there, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all part of, it's all good fun. So yeah. looking forward, right. Let's, let's talk about just quickly, let's say the next five years. And I, and I know you're involved a lot of times as the unspoken kind of social chair. I know we, we the party planning commission, as they would say on the office. What would you do different over the next five years? Or where, what would you like to see us do other than Le Mans? 
well, there's Le Mans and <laughs> like the ultimate cannonball run that we joke about. It's like cross country. We'll go to that course in Canada and we'll go to Pikes Peak and uh, Road America or whatever in Montana or Wisconsin, whatever it is. And <laughs> I mean, it's like, yes, this would be amazing. And it was like, oh, we'll just get a big rig or something. <laughs> uh, Car hauler. Mountain Man Dan is currently looking into that, by the way. He sent me a post <laughs> earlier. He, he just found a three-car hauler that he could pull with his dually, and I, I just shook my head. I was like, <laughs> doesn't surprise me in the least. Yeah, could you imagine? Last summer when we had dinner with Race Ron, he was talking about Arizona and <laughs> going out to the course there, and it's like, oh, we do a car hauler, and it's like, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, I mean, it's like going cross-country and just doing three or four big courses if we could actually coordinate it there's a guy there was an interview with him that you did because he came to shenandoah last year oh kona bob yeah yeah the website search for kona bob Mm -hmm. yep so i mean it's like he he went to every track in the states didn't he very last summer? close very close to he did a lot of the majors he spent yeah. uh, about six months going from track to track to track trying to fill his calendar every day and that's a really cool story that you bring up. And for those that want to look more into it, John Richter interviewed him and, and wrote that for us. And basically he bought a Shelby GT350 in California. He flew in from Hawaii and then spent the next six months just doing track days. It was yeah. a bucket list thing for him, something he needed to get done. And when he was all said and done, he Excuse ended up me. back in California. <clears throat> he had apparently another Shelby waiting for him in Hawaii when he returned home. So it's pretty cool. I mean, we all have our bucket lists. And so, I mean good on him for actually being able to do it. I wish to be at that position at some point in my life too, right? But right. I, I don't think it's ever going to get out of my system. I mean, mm -hmm. we're talking about me, but we'll see where it goes. <laughs> yep. Well, and going back to talking about 2023 with Le Mans trip, I'm like, I'm saying to Mike, it's like, okay, we fly into Frankfurt and we start there and we drive the seven hours over to Le Mans and we do that. And then we'll go to, what is it? Bob Franchon <laughs> in Belgium and the other course in Belgium. And then just an hour east of that is Nürburgring. And then we'll hang out in Frankfurt for a couple of days, go to Hockenheim and then we're back in Frankfurt. And it's like, okay, we've got two weeks there. <laughs> uh, it's going to be a really cool vacation. Uh, yeah. The Chiefs are still planning it out. They're still trying to sort out the details. Something yeah. that large, that extensive is going definitely going to take a while. But yeah, Absolutely. I, I like how you reference it now like the rest of us do. That, that other track in Belgium that isn't Spa, which for the listeners out there, Zolder, which is an old at Formula One track. Thank you. <laughs> Everybody knows Spa. Everybody knows Le Mans. Nürburgring, yeah, okay. Hockenheim, maybe not so much. But then it's like, I know there's one other course in Belgium. Can't think of the name. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a lot of fun. I look forward to the future. And I look yeah. forward to what the future brings you guys. And congratulations again. Thank you on the uh, the little one coming. Girl racers. <laughs> Girl racers. Girl power, for sure. Yeah. Can't wait till mine are old enough to push the pedals properly. Then, we, then, right. then I'm in deep trouble. But with that, Chrissy, I can't thank you enough. I mean, you, the whole family, you've been supporting us forever. And that's that's a blessing. And, and I just can't say enough nice things. And again, the future is still unwritten. So we're going to see where things go. But I don't see it without the Crutchfields being involved. And again, you guys are prominent members in the club. And if listeners, if you get the chance to meet both Mike and Chrissy, special people, great people, can't, can't do this without them. So I can't thank you enough for being on the show. Yeah. Thank you for having me. All right. With that, it's time to end. All right. <laughs> Thanks. If you like what you've heard and want to learn more about GTM, be sure to check us out on www.gtmotorsports.org. You can also find us on Instagram at Grand Touring Motorsports. Also, if you want to get involved or have suggestions for future shows, you can call or text us at 202-630-1770 or send us an email at crewchief at gtmotorsports.org. We'd love to hear from you. Hey listeners, Crew Chief Eric here. Do you like what you've seen, heard, and read from GTM? Great, so do we, and we have a lot of fun doing it. But please remember, we're fueled by volunteers and remain a no annual fee organization, but we still need help to keep the momentum going so that we can continue to record, 
write, edit, and broadcast all of your favorite content. So be sure to visit www.patreon.com forward slash GT Motorsports or visit our website and click in the top right corner on the support and donate to learn how you can help.